There is not one single thing that has ever happened to you or will happen to you that will be wasted. If you look at every single crisis, difficulty, challenge, every joy-filled moment that comes into your being, everything is there showing up to make you more of who you were meant to be. Need motivation? Watch your top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I watch these videos every day because I need them for motivation. Being around successful entrepreneurs every morning helps me believe that I can do great things too. It's like your morning coffee, but for your goals, kickstarting your day with a blast of positivity. So here is a challenge for you. Try watching one video every morning for the next 30 days, and let's find out together if they help you do great things too. If you're in, leave a hashtag believe in the comments below so I can celebrate with you. So today, listen from one of the best, Oprah Winfrey, and our take on our top 10 rules of success, Believe. Rule number two is learn to say no. The lesson that you learn from allowing yourself to be abused as a child is an ongoing lesson. Um, what I recognize is that the same thing that in some cases causes a child to be abused is the same thing that causes uh, you know a, you to be abused as an adult is the same thing that in your adulthood that allows you to never be able to say no to people and i realized that i was the kind of child who was always searching for um for love and affection and attention and somebody to say to look at me and say yes you are worthy and Unfortunately, there are adults who will take advantage of that and misread your intentions. And I, you know, just part of the process for me as an adult has come, has been to come to recognize that my inability as an adult female to say no, uh, my, I, I call it my disease to please as a female, is the same thing that caused me to be victimized as a child. Because many times I would get myself into situations as an adult where I didn't want to say no because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I didn't want to say no because I didn't want anybody angry with me. I didn't want to say no because I don't want people to think I'm not nice. And it, that, to me, has been the greatest lesson of my life, is to recognize that I am solely responsible for it and um, not trying to please other people, not living my life to please other people, but doing what my heart says all the time. That's the biggest lesson for me. Rule number three is practice gratitude. I've done multiple interviews over the years, so I sound like a some kind of broken record. Ra, la, la, gratitude. But it really is my religion. It is the thing that I base my everything on. Is I the, When I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I think. I train myself to say thank you first before you start with what am I gonna do? What a, even this morning in the hotel, I was like, uh, uh, what is the noise outside? Thank you, you go to thank you first. You start your day with thank you, and I end my day with thank you. And that, that is my spiritual practice, that is my deepest, greatest spiritual practice. And training, training myself to do that, and if you train yourself to do that, you walk through life feeling the abundance instead of the scarcity. Rule number four is focus on service. Everybody has a different talent. And the reason we're all so messed up is because you're looking at everybody else's yeah. talent yeah. and wishing you had some of their talent. All the energy that you spend thinking about, wishing about, being jealous of, envious of anybody else is energy that you're not only putting out, it's gonna come back to you negatively, but you're taking that away from you. All your energy should be forced on what do I have to offer? What do I have to give? How can I be used in service? Because Dr. King's message of not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And there is not a job in here that you can do that you don't switch the paradigm to service and not make that job more fulfilling. I don't care what the job is. If you say, I'm a singer, I'm a dancer, I'm an artist, I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I'm a janitor, I'm a, I'm a clerk, I'm a, if you say, if I look at this from, how do I use this in service to something bigger than myself? Yes. It no longer becomes a job, it becomes an offering to the world. 
Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight our favorite lessons from the video that will inspire you to remember what you learned today and actually apply them. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is accept mistakes. We went on the air with the Oprah Winfrey show in 1986 nationally. And people say, oh, but you're, you're, God, you're so comfortable in front of the camera, you can be yourself. Well, it's because I've been being myself since I was 19. And I would not have, I would not have been able to be as comfortable with myself had I not um, made mistakes on the air and been allowed to make mistakes on the air and understand that it doesn't matter. You know, I, there's no such thing to me as an embarrassing moment. No such thing. If I tripped and fell, if my bra strap showed, if my slip fell off, if I fell flat on my face, there's no such thing as an embarrassing moment because I know that there is not a moment that I could possibly experience on the air that somebody else hasn't already experienced. So when it happens, you say, oh, my slip fell off. And it's, it's no big deal. I mean, like, I was on TV the other day and somebody says, oh, Oprah, you have a run. Have you not seen a run before in your life? Well, I get them too, let me tell you. So, I mean, I, I can't be embarrassed. I can't be embarrassed. Now, when I first started out, that was not true because I was under the, I was pretending to be somebody I was not. I was pretending to be Barbara Walters. So I'd go to a news conference and I was more interested in how I phrased the question and how eloquent the question sounded, as opposed to listening to the answer. I was so, which always happens when you're interested in, in impressing people instead of doing what you're supposed to be doing. And it took me a while. It took me messing up on the air on during a live newscast. I was doing a list of foreign countries, and I there was all these foreign names, and, and then Canada was thrown in, and I call Canada Canada, and I got so tickled that I call Canada. I go, that wasn't Canada, that was Canada. Excuse me, that wasn't Canada, that, was, that wasn't Canada, that was Canada. And then I started laughing. Well, it, was, it, was, it became, a mo became the first real moment I ever had. And um, the news director later said to me, well, if you do that, then you should just keep going. You shouldn't correct yourself and let people know. Well, I know, well, who's ever heard of Canada? So that was, for me, the beginning of realizing that, oh, you can laugh at yourself and you can make a mistake and it's not the end of the world. You don't have to be perfect. And... Uh, Biggest lesson for me for television, because then it didn't matter. Rule number six is surround yourself with success. How do you think about innovation, change, transformation, and how do you empower the people around you to do it? Because you're Oprah, but you couldn't have done all this by yourself. Of course, you, the, the most important thing that all of you are gonna find when you leave here is who do you surround yourself with? How do you build your team? And as I was sharing with some folks earlier, you, the more successful you become, the more people you have around you who are willing just to please you. So you have to have a core team of people. You have to have your core buddies, your core, I call it my kitchen cabinet, people that are going to always tell you the truth. And all of my innovation has come from the question of how can I be used. First of all, let me just say this. I do not think there is any real life without a spiritual life. There is no real life without a spiritual life. And by spiritual, I mean religion, if that's what you want or need. But I mean understanding that there is a force greater than yourself, whatever you choose to call it, whether you call it creator of the divine or call it Allah or call it universal energy, there is a force greater than yourself that created you, however you believe you got to be here. And true freedom comes when you align your mind with the divine. True freedom comes when you use the energy of your personality to serve the calling of your soul. And so you can line those two things up. So all of my innovation and all of my progress has come from 
being in alignment with what I really came to do. Rule number seven is have good intentions. I was interviewing a woman uh, on one of the shows. It was so impressive for me to see all the shows that we've done. Lord, it made me tired looking at it. Uh, but I was interviewing a woman. It was a show called The Mistress, The Wives Meet the Mistresses or some crazy thing. And this woman was on and it was a live show. And in the middle of it, her husband tells the wife and our entire audience and the world that his mistress was pregnant. Yes. To this day, it makes my eyes water because I saw his wife's face. And I felt her humiliation. And I said, I will quit TV if I have to do this. I won't do this anymore. And my producer's like, what are we going to do? This is what everybody's doing. And then that same, during that same time period, so I said, I'm not going to do anything like that anymore. I'm not going to not going to bring people on TV. First of all, we, all, we didn't know that moment was going to happen. They were like, we didn't know it was going to happen. But that should not happen on television. And I do not want to be a part of the energy that caused somebody to feel that because that's not going to come back to me. I got to pay for that. Then I was interviewing the KKK on stage. That was the day the one guy called me a monkey in the audience. And during commercial break, I could see them signaling each other. And just watching them and their behavior, I thought, oh, they get it. I don't get it. They are using me. They are using this platform because they understand, because I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to tell you all about the KKK. They were using it to recruit members for themselves. They were using it to recruit their base. And I then went to the producers and said, I'm not doing a show like that. So they said, you're not going to do the mistresses, you're not... <laughs> You're not going to do it? What are we going to do? So I said, we, we, we are going to um, create a baseline for ourselves that's based on intention. This was around 1989 when I'd read Gary Zukov's book called The Seat of the Soul. And that book was life-changing for me because in it he talked about the power of intention and that cause and effect what goes out comes back, is determined by your intention. The energy of your intention is what determines your life. Most people don't think about their intention. They just think about what they want to do. Most people don't think about why they want to do it. But what's going to come back to you, the energy that's going to come back to you, is the real why of why you did it. And so I then said to my producers, we're not going to do any shows that are not intentional. So don't bring me an idea unless you have an intention for the show that you want the outcome to be. And we're going to strive to see if we can live up to our intentions. And so around the late 80s, we started a pre-show to talk about what the intention was, and then a post-show after every single show to say, did we fulfill that intention? And that's about the time I realized this is bigger than me. Rule number eight is take charge of your life. The greatest thing about what I do, for me, is that I'm in a position to change people's lives. It is the most incredible platform for influence that you could imagine. And it's something that I hold in great esteem and take um, full responsibility for. I mean, I do every show in prayer, not down on my knees praying, but I do it in, in sort of before every show, um, a mental meditation in order to get the correct message across because you're dealing with millions of people every day and it's very easy for something to be misinterpreted. And so my intention is always, regardless of what the show is, whether it's about sibling rivalry or wife battering or children of divorce, for people to see within each show that you are responsible for your life, that although there may be tragedy in your life, there's always a possibility to triumph. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, and that the ability to triumph begins with you. Always. Always. Rule number nine is earn success. My biggest frustration is not just with young women. My biggest frustration is also with young men, young people who think that, and I have a lot of this with my girls in college, they think that success is supposed to happen like that. that. 
Yeah. They think yes. that there isn't a process to it. They think that they're supposed to come out of college and have their brand. And um, I recognize now that I am a brand, but I was resistant to being called a brand for many years because I was like, I'm a brand, I'm not a brand, I'm, I'm a person. But how I got to be a brand was not trying to be a brand. Yes. How I got to be a brand was every day making choices that felt like this is the right move, now that's the right move, and now that's the next right move, the next right move. And so my frustration with young women and young men yes. is that they think it's supposed to happen like this, and they don't understand that there's a process to it. Social media. Yes, social media. <laughs> you did not get to be editor of Vogue magazine by not working and working and working yes. and working and working to get here. I love the theory of that there's 10,000 hours behind anybody who ever gets to be successful. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is get in sync with life. The first law is the third law of motion in physics, which says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we showed that very beautifully in The Color Purple, when Miss Seeley says to Mr., everything you even try to do to me is already done to you. Mm. That is not just a, a rhetorical saying, that is law. That is Newton's third law of motion in physics, which says everything that goes out is coming back. Mm. It's just like everything that goes up is coming down, may take it a long time to come down, is coming down. <laughs> everything that goes out is coming back, it's coming back. So. To answer the power of manifestation and meditation, what meditation does is sync you up with the source. What meditation does is allows you to literally tap into the power that created you so that you are in alignment with that. And so when you carry that out into the world, everything that you do comes from the center of that alignment that's coming from the source that we call God, we call divine energy, divine intelligence, whatever name you want to give it to, we call life. When you are synced up with life, life just gives to you. You will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal, there really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself as a human being. You want to max out your humanity by using your energy to lift yourself up, your family, and the people around you. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The world needs people like Michael Stalzenberg from Fort Lauderdale. When Michael was just eight years old, Michael nearly died from a bacterial infection that cost him both of his hands and both of his feet. And in an instant, this vibrant little boy became a quadruple amputee, and his life was changed forever. But in losing who he once was, Michael discovered who he wanted to be. He refused to sit in that wheelchair all day and feel sorry for himself. So with prosthetics, he learned to walk and run and play again. He joined his middle school lacrosse team and last month when he learned that so many victims of the Boston Marathon bombing would become new amputees, Michael decided to banish that darkness with light. Michael and his brother Harris created Mikey'sRun.com to raise $1 million for other amputees by the time Harris runs the 2014 Boston Marathon. More than a thousand miles away from here, these two young brothers are bringing people together to support this Boston community the way their community came together to support Michael. And when this 13-year-old man was asked about his fellow amputees, he said this, first, they will be sad. They're losing something they will never get back. And that's scary. I was scared but they'll be okay. 
They just don't know that yet. We might not always know it. We might not always see it or hear it on the news or even feel it in our daily lives, but I have faith that no matter what, class of 2013, you will be okay. And you will make sure our country is okay. I have faith because of that nine-year-old girl who went out and collected the change. I have faith because of David and Francine Wheeler. I have faith because of Michael and Harris Stolzenberg. And I have faith because of you, the network of angels sitting here today. One of them, Khadija Williams, who came to Harvard four years ago. <laughs> Khadija had attended 12 schools in 12 years, living out of garbage bags, amongst pimps and prostitutes and drug dealers, homeless, going into department stores, Walmart in the morning to bathe herself so that she wouldn't smell in front of her classmates. And today she graduates as a member of the Harvard class of 2013. For 10 more amazing rules from Maya Angelou, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. So whenever I'm obliged to do something, I take that painting and I look at that painting. There's an empty chair. And I think, now, what would grandma do? What would she say?